Welcome to the Lover's Hole. We are Ian and Mike, and we are rereading in this podcast of ours the Aubrey Maturin novels of one of our favourite authors, Patrick O'Brien. We're partway through Master and Commander, as I'm sure you already know. Uh, Mike, where in the Master and Commander story have we got to and what's coming up this week? Oh, uh, Ian, we, we just finished off chapter five last time where... After a heavy blow, Jack's brilliant strategy and, you know, kind of overnight there landed the Sophie's first prize shortly after the morning light here. We met a Danish brig that could have been the Sophie's twin with a little bit of paintwork. And the Sophie took her second prize in that chapter as well, a French ship loaded with gunpowder and the master's wife in labor. Now, Dylan and Stephen had a very revealing conversation about liberty, men, and the differences in their respective involvement with the United Irishmen as they brought the prize into Mahan together. Now, this time in Chapter 6, Stephen's going to provide some insights into men's character, growing older, and what happens when they start exercising authority. Uh, We get an excellent example of what we sometimes call Jack ashore at Molly Hart's route and Jack at sea with his midshipmen. There's a chilling look into human nature, superstition, and prejudice with a very funny fishtail that might also be a fable to top it all off. And we're going to get some insights into the Irish Rebellion of 1798, with our special guest star, Paddy Cullivan. Fantastic. Can't wait. Really looking forward to the conversation with Paddy. Really looking forward as well to hearing some of these reflections and these thoughts. And I might, we're back ashore. We're back ashore. We finished off the chapter last week uh, after a really exciting spell afloat with the Sophie doing her naval thing. And we're back into the world of life ashore in Mahon. Stephen Maturin staying with his new colleague, his new friend, Mr. Flory, who's the local naval surgeon. He's in Flory's house overlooking Mahon Harbour. And as a bachelor, Mr. Flory's free to invite guests and to store specimens like Stephen's. Um, and I think also a horticultural collection belonging to another surgeon major. Uh, this is all sounding pretty cozy for Stephen. He's fallen on his feet back in Mahon. Um, he's got a cozy apartment and a solitary friend to go hang out with. He's looking down in the harbour, watching swifts fly by his window whilst writing in his diary, keeping watch on Jack and the Sophie. Now, Mike, we're going to come to what's going on with Jack and the Sophie and the crew and hear how they're doing this bright, sunny day. But we start off deep in reflective mode with Stephen and his diary. Right. Well, you know, as you say, in, you know, Stephen's writing, he's writing in this secret shorthand, kind of capturing what he's learned, that James Dillon is a Catholic mm-hmm. um, and, and notes that, you know, Dillon never seemed religious before and wonders what changed and, and speculates that perhaps whatever that changes and this Catholicism is what's causing Dillon's agitated state of mind. So, Stephen remembers hearing that, you know, there were many what he calls crypto Catholics in the army. And he wonders if the same is true for the Navy. So Stephen writes, and and I think here he's, you know, he's looking at himself and Jack and Dylan in particular. And he says, what is more, it appears to me that this is a critical time for him here, Dylan, a lesser climacteric a time that will settle him in that particular course he will never leave again, but will persevere in for the rest of his life. It has often seemed to me that towards this period in which we all three lie, more or less, men strike out their permanent characters or have those characters struck into them. Merriment, roaring high spirits before this, and then some chance concatenation or some hidden predilection or rather inherent bias, working through, and the man is in the road he cannot leave but must go on, making it deeper and deeper, a groove, a channel, until he is lost in his mere character, persona, 
no longer human, but an accretion of qualities belonging to this character. James Dillon was a delightful being. Now he is closing in. It is odd, will I say, heartbreaking? How cheerfulness goes, gaiety of mind, natural free-springing joy. Authority is its great enemy, the assumption of authority. I know few men over 50 that seem to me entirely human, virtually none who has long exercised authority. Ah, gospel according to Stephen Matron. Yeah, and uh, bad news for us, Mike. When, when either of us finally reaches fifty, we're going to be we're going to be a shadow of our former selves, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and imagine me coming up on it twice, man. That's no good. <laughs> <laughs> But but this anti-authoritarian thing, this is really at the heart of Stephen's kind of personality and his philosophy and his politics. Uh, he goes on to reflect on the captains and admirals that he's known or he's heard of that seem to prove the point. Um, he remembers Jack's description of Nelson, thinking here that Stephen admires Jack and Jack admires Nelson. So this is meant to be a, a positive deviant, if you like. Um, direct, he says, direct, unaffected, and as amiable a man as could be wished, much like Jack himself. So that's praise for nelson and jack is still cheerful as stephen reflects on this he's still in that joyous phase of his life but stephen wonders and and mike this is a really great sentence that sticks with me stephen writes to himself how long will it last what woman political cause disappointment wound disease untoward child defeat what strange surprising accident will take it all away Wow. 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 <laughs> and as, as I think we've had cause to say before, there's the arc of the next 11 novels kind of taken care of. <laughs> and I, I wonder if he knew, you know, I wonder if he thought, I'll dash this phrase off and then look back at it and thought, oh, I see some ideas here. Or right. if it's him with his character arc already plotted and he's raising this question in Stephen's mind to tease us because right. we're not going to get through a hundredth of this in the, in the current novel. But it's funny, you know, it, it reminds me of reading the first Harry Potter and listening to Snape talking about potions, putting a stopper in death and paying it very little mind. And <laughs> yeah. a long way on in the series. Went, oh, my gosh. Did she know? <laughs> so he looked back and reflected on what, what he's seen of, of, of men and their evolution. He's looked forward to the, what might be coming in uh, Jack Aubrey's character. And he then has a little moment to worry about James Dillon. Yeah. He writes, he is mercurial as ever he was, more so, only now it is all ten octaves lower down and in a darker key. And sometimes I'm afraid in a black humor, he will do himself a mischief. All right. A, a, a really important sentence again for thinking about where James wow. Dillon might be headed. And it's, uh, you know, part of the ah, part of the Aubrey Matcher in canon kind of playbook that we talk about music. Stephen would really like for Jack and Dylan to become friends. He sees, as we've already pointed out, that they're alike in so many ways. He describes Dylan as made for friendship and hopes that Dylan might see that he, Dylan, is mistaken about Jack's conduct. And, and conduct is a code word for, for courage, for physical courage in battle. And he speculates that Dylan might not see that in Jack and just carry on making Jack the focus of his discontent. And Stephen's really concerned that Dylan's own internal discontent is so severe in a man who is already relatively so humorless, so demanding of honor, uh, and who must always try to reconcile the irreconcilable, you know, because of all of his conflicts around his religious faith and oaths and honor. He imagines that in many ways, a horrible confrontation might be coming for Dylan. And he reflects now on the much wider picture. Uh, He thinks about, you know, the possibility of Bonaparte befriending the Pope, um, France invading Ireland again, and we're going to talk about that shortly, Dylan being the officer on a ship that might capture the leaders of the United Irishmen. Suppose, says the novel, suppose it had been he who took Wolf Tone in Loch Swilly, and we'll come to Wolf Tone and maybe even Loch, Loch Swilly later on. It's, it's really sad, lots and lots of foreboding, and Stephen knows that Dylan is a loyal person. He um, hopes that if Dylan can befriend Jack sometime when he's feeling better, that there might be a lasting friendship to be had there. And, and maybe he also hopes, generously on our part, I think, he hopes that this might help Dylan to escape some of his conflict. And Stephen writes in the diary, I would give a great deal to bring them friends. And 
Mike, it's, it's it's a really nice moment for us to get connected to Stephen. He's got this very, very caring character. He would so much like friendship. You know, he values connections between humans as much higher in importance than connections between governments and peoples and philosophers. He right. values connection between people, and he'd really like to foster those connections. Yeah. And it's a nice foreshadowing. You know, we keep mentioning this, and we don't want to give any spoilers away, but, you know, we, we keep mentioning that Stephen's going to have uh, another kind of career, if you will, <laughs> yeah. a simultaneous career that we're going to learn of later. And here's one where, you know, we, we see him very curious about people's motivations. He's a very skilled observer and he's depressed and discouraged by the burden of knowing and thinking about people this way. Yeah. And he's capturing all these observations in a secret code. So it's going to be another little, you know, we've had this ongoing debate. Was Stephen here? Was he not? So we'll we'll just put another little, another little pin in that here, right? Well, let's just say, I don't think he's shaping up to be an accountant. Let's put it like that. (laughs) That's right. That's right. An undertaker, but without the personality. (laughs) Is that, is that an accountant? No. no. I think so. (laughs) So, Oh my gosh, Sam, maybe we should strip that. I don't know. <laughs> my apologies to all the undertakers and accountants that I just offended there. Right? Absolutely. So Stephen stops writing and he sets his pen down and, and O'Brien's quick to tell us that he's setting it down on the cover of a jar full of spirits of wine containing the most beautiful asp that he's ever seen. And it's an asp that he caught while exploring Menorca when, uh, you know, he came in on the prize with Dylan before the Sophie had come in with her third prize, a fair-sized Spanish tartan, you know, uh, sailing behind her there. So Stephen, again, checks his watch. He looks down to make sure Jack hasn't left the ship yet. And he sees Jack dressed resplendently in his best uniform, uh, standing down there looking at the rigging with Dylan and the bosun. Um, He also sees some of the drunk Sophies, the prize crews from the first two prizes who've been ashore now uh, before the Sophies have gotten ashore. And they're right down past the wine shops, taking their silver, some of their prize money and skimming it into the water as frenzied little naked boys dive into, you know, to kind of (laughs) salvage these coins here. And O'Brien writes that Stephen refers to this as getting rid of their wealth in the most compendious manner known to men. So, you know, a very concise and succinct way to do this. I, 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 you know, I, I used to always joke that, you know, I might as well just when I was studying efficiency, expertise and everything else, don't drink the beer, just walk in and pour it in the toilet or <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll kind of simplify and re-engineer this process here or or of a pastor who had returned from his first winter bird hunting trip at a friend's invitation. He said, if he were ever tempted to do it again, he'd sit in a tub full of ice water and tear up hundred dollar bills. I guess that's more like skimming the silver <laughs> into, yeah. the, into the harbor there. At well, Vermont. it's it's quite the tax avoidance maneuver, isn't it? If, you, if you're going to drink it all and that's the way it's headed anyway, why don't you chuck it in the water to begin with and the tax man doesn't get his cut? There you go. Huh. So um, we get this nice change of points of view. It's, it's a classic O'Brien trick, and we, we're having it already, this connection between Stephen up high in the harbour overlooking, and now we're going to shift down to Jack and the, the, the crew aboard the Sophie. Jack, with his fiddle in his fiddle case, head to shore, and as this little movement takes place, Stephen removes one of his feet from soaking in the, in the bowl of uh, cold water in front of him there and he looks at it and he starts to think about the comparative anatomy he's thinking about the the bones of the legs and the feet and the hands and the extremities of horses and apes and orangutans we get thinking about the pongo we get thinking about chimps uh we have mr buffon the famous french naturalist who discovered or described this animal called a jocko it was featured a drawing of a chimp standing upright with a walking stick looking like a man this is back in the days when people were Pretty, pretty grotesque and pretty Catholic in the way that they used to write, you know, these kind of bestiaries and things. He thinks about anatomy. He thinks about apes and he thinks to himself, who am I to affirm that the gay young ape is not merely the chrysalis, as it were, the pupa of the grim old solitary, that the second state is not the natural inevitable culmination, the Pongo's true condition, alas. And Mike, this is yet another really quite downbeat reflection on aging and on the 
well, what's what's the natural end state for man? Is it to be old and decrepit and alone and a little bit broken as a character, or is it, mm. or is that just a kind of covering up of a sort of kind of inner joy that we have when we're young? And maybe this is a continuation of Stephen's thoughts about Dylan, about men in authority, about people crushed by incidents that come come along in their lives. Like it's once again a really fascinating piece of introspection by Stephen. And I think this is going to be a theme that we and Stephen are going to come back to, especially with relation to Jack Aubrey again and again in the canon later on. Well, as Stephen's thinking here to himself, Jack pops into the door. Stephen comments that he's been contemplating on the Pongo. Uh, and, and we'll hear about orangutans again in the canon here. So keep this you know, <laughs> idea about Pongos, people, orangutans closely in mind. And, and Jack, I just love, Jack says, I'm sure you were, and a damned credible thing to be contemplating on, too, which was a nice way to say, I'm being polite now. Why the hell aren't you dressed? We've got places to go. So he tells Stephen that, you know, unless he spreads a little more canvas, they're not going to get to their first appointment on time, and then they're going to be late to Mrs. Hart's party. So um, as as he's telling Stephen what to do, a Montpellier snake glides out from some of Stephen's things, Jack hops up into a chair, obviously very upset, and asks Stephen if it's poisonous. And Stephen, who is just going about his mundane task of getting ready, comments, oh, extremely so. I dare say it'll attack you directly. I have very little doubt of it. Now, was I to put the silk stockings over my worsted stockings? Sure, the hole would not show, but then I should stifle with the heat. Do you not find it uncommonly hot? Jack says, oh, my God, this thing must be two fathoms long. Tell me, is this really poisonous or in your oath now? And Stephen says, well, if you thrust your hand down its throat as far as its back teeth, you may meet a little venom, but not otherwise. Uh, and as, as Stephen you know, looks up at Jack and tells him he, he looks like a pretty pitiful figure up on this chair. And Stephen starts singing Barney, Barney, Bucker Doe. He has kept me out of Channel Row. And he's singing to this snake who is kind of just happy and smiling back at Stephen as Stephen carries him off, even though, as we know, snakes can't hear. But yeah. I guess like an Indian snake charmer, something is in here, you know, working away. Um, and then Stephen starts saying, you know, I really wanted to take about a dozen of these on board the Sophie to control the rats, except for the foolish, illiberal persecution of reptiles. Mm. Mm. Boy, Ian, a lot going on in this paragraph, huh? There is, there is. Well, let, let's dig into the snake, first of all. <laughs> right. Now, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a really great device that O'Brien uses a lot in the canon, this idea of, you know, personifying uh, an animal or an insect, something from nature and from nature and using it to foreshadow or kind of highlight a little bit of an emotional message here. Um, the snake is introducing an idea that might be important to us shortly in this chapter and certainly later on in the book. We're going to play on the theme of superstition a bit, and we know that serpents play a, you know, a role as kind of villainous creatures in the Bible, for example. Stephen's trying to teach Jack this lesson about fear and superstition by kind of teasing him for his, his rather un unjustified fear of the snake. And it is unjustified. This snake, I think, Mike, this Montpellier snake is a real species of snake found widely around the Mediterranean not considered to be harmful to humans because exactly as Stephen said, its fangs are toward the rear of its mouth. The venom's not very toxic. So he was absolutely practicing upon Jack when he said, oh yes, it'll attack you directly. Um, therefore, medium-sized snake, venomous but not badly so, fangs at the back of its mouth, ideal for hunting rats. And interestingly, not only does it have these ideal properties for hunting rats, something that O'Brien might not have known the Montpellier snake may be the only snake which has been known on rare occasions to cannibalize females of its own species. There are some kinds of snake that will cannibalize males, but it's very, very rare for snakes to cannibalize females. And maybe this idea of predation and males and females is a theme that we might come back to as well, Mike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, so the, the song that Stephen sings to this snake about Barney, Barney, Buck or Doe, tell us a bit about that. Where's that from? Well, that's fascinating because this curious rhyme of Stevens um, comes from a Dublin physician like Stephen, this guy named John Brennan, who supported Catholic emancipation like Stephen 
But when a number of Catholic leaders were taking a petition to London, he wrote a satirical poem about it. And, and the rhyme began, Barney, Barney, Buck or Doe, who shall with the petition go? And, and this whole rhyme, this whole satirical rhyme, supposedly earned him a 200 pound a year pension from Dublin Castle. Uh, now, unlike Stephen, Brennan was also known to be a wrestler who would break men's shins and then offer to fix them for a price. He was a big turpentine advocate for all sorts of things, some, some mm-hmm. uh, that worked and some didn't. And he was believed to be mentally unbalanced. Uh, no on kidding. his deathbed, he's said to have continually repeated, Barney, Barney, Buck or Doe has kept me out of Channel Row. This is the phrase that Stephen had used here. So you know, we're pointing at Brennan's deathbed phrase here. Now, Channel Row, interestingly, Channel Row is a poorhouse, and it's the actual poorhouse in which Brennan's mother had died. So perhaps... You know, Brennan saying that that little rhyme is the thing that gave him his income that, you know, kept him from dying like his mother had died. Uh, wow. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't it's, it's another one of these things with O'Brien kind of my gosh, where does he come up with these things? You know, sitting here yeah. writing in the 90s. Amazing. Well, well, Mike, since we're thinking about references to the Irish Rebellion and references to Dublin and references to Stephen and Dylan, um, this might be a good time to pause for a moment. And listening to a conversation that you and I had just a little while ago with our friend, Paddy Cullivan. We're joined today by our special guest, Paddy Cullivan. Paddy is a musician, storyteller, and entertainer with a passion for history. Paddy, I think you're well known to our Irish listeners, those few of them, as the frontman, the former frontman for the house band on RTE's flagship talk show, The Late Late Show. But Paddy's now focused on writing and presenting live shows focused on history. Paddy's toured what he calls his historical entertainments, all over Ireland and beyond. And Paddy, your first step on this journey was a show in 2019 called The Top 10 Dark Secrets of 1798, which gives us a clue about what brought us to you and what brought us to this podcast. Paddy, great to have you with us. Thank you. The photo of you on your website shows you in 18th century costume with a piano and and the green harp banner there and lots of green lightning. You're giving us some clues there. Tell us a bit about yourself and about how music and history and entertainment and Irish politics come together in, in the world of Pally Cullivan. Well, I was born in Galway, but I grew up in Georgian Dublin, which is a, a fascinating and beautiful, uh, no longer beautiful city, in a Georgian house in North Great Georgia Street. So already I was set for being obsessed with the 18th century, which is, of course, the, the century of the Georges. And in growing up there, these these homes were the homes of the the Parliament of Ireland, which was the Protestant Parliament for the Protestant people. Yeah. And they all had large country houses, but they built these four-story ones. You, you would see them in Boston. You would see them in London, of course, in Bloomsbury yeah. Square and things like that. But So I was set for that. And then I went to NCAD, which was the art college here, the great national art college. And I studied graphic design. But then I also formed a band uh, called the Camembert Quartet. Yeah. And so I had music, graphics, and then I did art history. So I'm very much a visual historian and I do shows wow. dressed in the gear as Wolf Tone, let's say, talking about the dark secrets of 1798, the bits of history that we've left out conveniently, uh, unofficial history. And I sing songs at them and I get great audiences coming along wanting to wanting to know about that time in history. And I suppose with these shows I put together on Wolf Tone and Michael Collins lately over COVID, uh, I was bringing all my skills together, art, history, music, visual history especially and i call it historical entertainment so that's what i do nice patty what connection do you have to the o'brien books the patrick o'brien books as you as you know our podcast is is reading through his aubrey mattress series but wanted to find out about you well i i adore the movie master and commander far side of the world and that's really my own introduction i i apologize guys from the time you call me i did not get a chance to read all the books <laughs> or even start them, but but I will, and because it is it is wonderful, and it's always it's always great to go back to the source material. But like I say, I'm a visual historian, so I really love film, and when it captures that era so well, uh, and of course, then in my later life, the Camembert Quartet became the house band on the longest running chat show of all time, the Late Late Show in Ireland. It's also the longest; it's about three hours long. It would 
it just drains the life out of you. It's fantastic. But I met Russell Crowe there, would you believe? Wow. And he sang with the band. He has his own music and his own stuff that he does in his spare time. And we talked extensively uh, about his role as, as Jack Aubrey because uh, he was absolutely wonderful in that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Big fans, big fans. So anyway, Master and Commander being the title of the movie is also the title of the first book in this 20-volume series. And we're rereading Master and Commander right now. We've gone right back to the beginning. And we're learning that two of the main characters, Stephen Maturin and James Dillon, were involved in the United Irishman. They were involved, tangentially at least, in the rebellion of 1798. So can you tell us then a bit about how the rebellion came about and you know th these key people and how people and countries and interests all fitted together here? Well, the 1798 rebellion takes its cues from, the, obviously, the American Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, which was successful, and the French Revolution uh, in 1789. So it really takes its cues from there. And nine years later, we have the pivotal rebellion of Irish history, really. This is the birth of Irish republicanism. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most fascinating aspects of it is, that I told you already about Irish society at the time, so they're building these beautiful houses. It's going through a huge economic upswing but it's a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. The Catholics are living under the penal laws and have done so for about 150 years. Uh, these are terrible laws, uh, you know, no right to bear arms, no right to own a horse of more than five pounds in value, no right to speak the Irish language, no right to buy insurance. So these are really strict, but unbelievably, and a lot of people don't know this, Presbyterians in Ireland were also under this yoke, which is why so many of them left Ireland, went to America and started the American Revolution. Which is, which is quite incredible. And the funniest thing about this period is that everything you think about Ireland, the, the battle of ideals between Catholics who are nationalists and green and Protestants who are unionists and orange, this is all turned on its head in 1798. The main bulk of the United Irish leadership were, 12, of the 18 of them, 12 were Protestants, three were Presbyterians, and only three were Catholic, including Theobald Wolf Tone, Lord Ever Fitzgerald, and they were generally well-to-do, middle-class, or like Lord Ever Fitzgerald, the richest man in the country. Wow. So wow. Th this was, again, and very similar, let's say, to the makeup of the, the revolutionaries in America, too. And they wanted emancipation for everybody. They wanted it for everyone to be equal in society, Protestant, Catholic, and dissenter, which is Presbyterian. Yeah. So Wolf Tone is the young lawyer that comes into this. He starts working in the early 1790s. They all take their cues from... The French Revolution. Can you believe that in 1792 in Belfast there was a Bastille Day parade? Can and it? it was made up of Presbyterians and Protestants. Oh. So it just goes to show you that the Protestants who later become the people who are loyal to British rule are actually the ones fighting against it. And so when finally, you know, when the rep when the rebellion breaks out, there are many Catholic militia in the Redcoats. Who are, who are suppressing United Irishmen who are Protestant. So the whole thing is very, very mixed up and strange. And, and you know, we don't hear much about the loyalists of America, mm -hmm. Mike, but they were they were large. And there's there's a, a very good TV show about that, um, about Washington spies. Um, right, right, right. Yes, it's fantastic. And so all of this is really, it, it's a very fascinating time, but it's also, like most Irish revolutions and rebellions, it's a dreadful failure. I mean, the interesting thing was that uh, Wolf Tone himself had to leave in 1795 because revolution was coming and the authorities were just rounding up anybody who was in the United Irishman. This was a fantastic organization. There was almost 250,000 of them in Ireland with only 12,000 soldiers left in Ireland to defend if France invades by sea. Wow. So uh, Wolf Tone emigrates in 1795 and on his way over to America, this bizarre thing I never realized, and of course it's a huge part of the master and commander world, uh, his ship is boarded. And 50 single men are just taken off the ship and press ganged into the Royal Navy with absolutely no buy or leave. And the only reason Wolf Tone isn't taken on board or is taken away is that he's with his wife, Matilda, and their three children. And he says, look, I'm a married man. And, and the Royal Navy say, OK, on you go. But I, I mean, This is the world we were living in. The, the, the world of the British Empire was a world of no law yeah. and the world of only the powerful. And yeah. this was the Ireland that the revolution happened in because everybody was suppressed. And there was, this, there was only just this Protestant ascendancy. So he goes to France and that's where he talks to the authorities and they say, yes, we will send an invasion fleet, 15,000 French troops in 40 ships. And they set sail in December, 1796 and get into Bantry Bay. 
why don't they land? Because if they had landed, I'd be eating in a beautiful bistro now, uh, <laughs> drinking good French wine and not with some rotten substandard garage food, which is what we have in Ireland at the moment. Um, why don't they land? Well, the story is officially that the Protestant wind blows. A Protestant wind comes and the mm. storm is so bad they're unable to land. This isn't true. They had, there was actually about three days they could land, but the, the invasion force had split in two and some of them were out at sea in the middle of the Atlantic and they were waiting for them to get back. So Tone says, well, why, why don't we land anyway? Who is in command? Emmanuel de Grouchy, who is a former uh, monarchist, uh, who is now uh, the general in charge of the landing fleet. And he says, no, we will wait. We will wait. We will wait until Hosh gets here. Hosh is the commander. And of course, the wind gets up. Uh, it gets too bad to land. And they had to set sail back to France. So the closest Ireland came to being free was stopped by Emmanuel de Grouchy, would you believe? So back in amongst 1798, we've got this um, coalition of all these people looking for emancipation and the, the, the rebellion of 1798 kind of takes hold here. T tell us about how the rebellion actually plays out, because it's a pretty grim story, isn't it? It's pretty grim. Uh, the failure of the French to land in 1796 uh, unleashes a wave of terror across Ireland. The government authorities... We always say that it's the British, but it's not. It's the British administration in Ireland, but it's really the Irish administration of Protestants. And they unleash a wave of terror, redcoats, you know, going house to house, awful tortures, um, you know, tarring and feathering, uh, whipping, um, half hanging, these dreadful things. And it, it, it completely, it scares, but it also radicalizes the population. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the whole rebellion is riven with spies, the commander in chief of the army is Lord Edward Fitzgerald, a man who fought at the Battle of Utah Springs in 1782 in South Carolina, is left wounded so badly on the battlefield that he's left for dead, is rescued by a, a, a runaway slave called Tony Small, um, who brings him back to health. And Tony goes back with Edward to Ireland to live in Leinster House, which is where our parliament is now. Yeah. But you see... Lord Edward is part of the, the richest family in Ireland. They're called the Dukes of Leinster. And they own a quarter of the country. I mean, they're richer than the British royal family. And, wow. and it's, it's incredible that he becomes a United Irishman and he becomes the head of the army. But sadly, on May 23rd, the night the rebellion is meant to break out, uh, he is holed up in a house in Thomas Street. Major Sir, who's head of the Dublin police, comes in and shoots Lord Edward in the shoulder. And he's brought to the prison. Now, they can't kill him because his father's the richest man in Ireland. Yeah. They can't hang him or anything like that. So all they do is they leave the wound to fester. And oh. doctors actually come along and pretend to tend to the wound, but they don't do anything to it. And he dies of sepsis two weeks later in agony. However, the rebellion does break out. But it breaks out hodgepodge. The entire leadership have been taken prisoner. Um, so... All you're left with is the foot soldiers who don't have guns because they're not allowed to have guns. So they have these things, eight foot pikes. So oh. they're they're fighting against redcoats who are fully armed. You can get off three shots in a minute and they only have eight foot pikes. It's bad, but they actually start having some success, particularly down in Wexford, where an army of about 15,000 get together and take over the, the town of Wexford and it becomes the Wexford Republic. So they have huge armies down there, armies of about 15,000 facing off against 15,000, pikes against guns. Not good, but when they're in close quarters, it actually works well. But it's a medieval weapon. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So the, bat the, the, the battles of, there are 21 battles in Wexford. It's a huge um, um, arena for the war. At the same time as Wexford's going on, Belfast breaks out and the county's down in Armagh where 4,000 troops under Henry Joy McCracken, General Munro, people like that. And they, they but it's a Presbyterian revolution. Yeah. But of course, it's never mentioned in the history books after mm -hmm. because it's too embarrassing. To, yeah. to the Protestant people for that to happen. There are unionists now who would be irredentist unionists who don't realise that six generations before they would have had relations fighting for Irish republicanism. It's hilarious. Now, the sad thing is uh, General Lake, there's a huge army, Lord Cornwallis, by the way, who surrendered to Washington. He yeah. comes into the country, assembles an army of about 35,000. They head down to Wexford and they massacre everybody. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people are killed after they lay down their arms. Uh, the, the, the most similar situation that the, the massacres of Wexford would be to would be to uh, Barbarossa, where in Russia, one in five people died. In Wexford, one in six people died. Wow. 20,000 out of the entire 120,000 population. 
So that suppresses the revolution, that dampens it down, it's gone. Down in Armagh are also defeated and wiped out, and there are Presbyterians hung all over the county. So the punishments are severe. If you want to get involved in this, the, the, the result is death. And so many people are scared. And I think this is where we, we feature the two lads in Master and Commander who, let's say, are now working for the empire. But yeah. the turnaround, it was such a vicious reaction, the year of terror and the, 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 the reaction to the rebellion, that many people just turned and said, look, I'll be a loyal servant of the British crown. That's it. You know, because they, they, they felt that republicanism had got so many of them and their friends killed. Mm. The final battle, if you will, and, and I, I love it that in, in the book, Stephen often refers to this as the rising rather than the rebellion. And I, I just, mm-hmm. I don't, I, I've had the choice. But the final battle is a, is a naval battle. Is that right? Correct. Apart from the Bantry Bay fiasco, yeah. there are three other naval incursions on Ireland. Uh, the most successful is the 23rd of August. So a month after the rebellion has been crushed in Wexford and down in Armagh, Incredibly, three French ships with over a thousand professional troops land in Kalala in Mayo and begin one of the most amazing two weeks in Irish history. They gather to them about two and a half thousand Irish troops. They invade Kalala, they invade all of Mayo, and they make the British run so fast out of Castle Bar, the capital of Mayo. It's called the Races of Castle Bar. Mm. It's amazing. And they set up a thing called the, the Connacht Republic and they issue their own money. And they bring in that ridiculous French decimal system of 10 days to the week, <laughs> 10 months to the year, all the rest of it. That thankfully, England and America <laughs> nipped in the bud. <laughs> but, and I'd like to try it someday, but I'm not sure, too sure I'd be very happy with it. But they have to go. Eventually, of course, the 35,000 British army surrounds them. Mm. Uh, they are defeated at the Battle of Balnamuk. Again, horrendous massacres, except for the French who were sent home. But their leader, Jan Joseph Amabel Humbert, who we call Humbert because the Irish refuse to pronounce French words correctly. Yeah. Mm. Um, but he is he has spared his life and he is sent uh, packing back to France. So the rebellion is ended there. And then the, the fourth and final naval incursion, of course, is the Battle of Tory Island. Right. And this is where Wolf Tone himself, Wolf Tone has been arranging all of this stuff in France. And he finally says, I, I need to get going uh, I will go with this last force of 3,000 that is being sent to Donegal to land. Now, as yet unaware of the failures of Humbert and Tandy, um, a third and final mission from France to Ireland leaves Brest on September 16th. Under General John Hardy, it comprises 3,000 men spread across nine ships, eight frigates, and the warship Hosh, named after Tone's old friend who failed to land in Bantry Bay. In command of Hosh is Commodore Jean-Baptiste Francois Bompard, a veteran of the American War, whose experience leaves him in no doubt as a challenge ahead because the British Navy and her wooden walls, as they call them, are now dominating the seas. So the French Mediterranean fleet has been wiped out by Nelson at the Battle of the Nile in August 1798, stranding Napoleon and his army in the Middle East. And not for the first time, Bonaparte's decision not to invade Ireland would haunt him. If Napoleon had invaded Ireland, he even wrote it in his autobiography, if I'd done that, I would have won the war. Wow. So aboard Hosh is Wolf Tone himself. Now, he's long the background strategist, but he finally wants to take part in the in the fight. Um, he felt that if France only sent a corporal's guard, it was his duty to go. So he leaves behind Matilda and the three small children, and they will never see him again. Wow. So maintaining his rank of adjutant general, Tone's given a role of gunnery officer in command of one of the three decks of batteries aboard the Hosh. Her 72 cannons made her the close-range battering ram that should safely bring the small force to a planned landing in Ulster. However, Humbert's success in August had caught the Royal Navy napping and it would never be allowed to happen again. Bompart's convoy of ships is spotted immediately, heading out into the Atlantic, and a cat-and-mouse pursuit begins that will last for three weeks. So the small fleet heads in the direction of the Americas, with the British close behind. Bompart swerves towards Ireland and uses the intemperate weather to shake them off, running close to convoys of hundreds of enemy ships, but avoiding detection. So despite sustaining heavy storm damage, by October 10th, Hosh and three frigates had reached the northwest coast of Donegal and moored close to Tory Island in preparation for a landing in Loch Swilly. But the next morning, a new British fleet appears on the horizon under Commodore Sir John Borlase Warren. With seven warships and two frigates, the French are totally outmatched. Bompard orders his other ships to retreat. Hosh would make the desperate fight alone to give them a chance to get away. 
One ship, Bish, sends a schooner to collect people for the retreat. The French command pleads with Wolf Tone and the other Irish offers to evacuate Hosh and return to France to fight another day. Our contest is hopeless. We will be prisoners of war. But what will become of you? The Irish refuse, Tone speaking for all of them. Shall it be said that I fled while the French were fighting the battles of my country? So in the early hours of October 12th, the last great naval action of the 18th century begins, known today or unknown, as may be the case, as yeah. the Battle of Tory Island. So Bompard makes a beeline for Loxwilly. Warren sends four warships in pursuit. And anyone who has read or seen Master and Commander will have some idea of the desperate conditions of what follows. Four surrounding one ship. Hosh is pummeled mercilessly for four hours, giving as good as she gets, her 72 guns answering the vastly superior armaments ranged against her. Wolf Tone commanded a battery of guns and fought with the utmost desperation as if courting death. Bompard, the commander himself, says that Wolf Tone displayed the utmost coolness and bravery. Now, the Freeman's Journal had mocked Wolf Tone as a constitution monger. You know, he was just lazy in, in France, but here he was fighting with the best of them. But valor alone cannot even the odds. And William Tone, his son's description of the scene is unmatched. During six hours, Hosh sustains the fire of a whole fleet till her masts and rigging were swept away. Her scuppers flowed with blood. Her wounded filled the cockpit. Her shattered ribs yawned at each new stroke and let in five feet of water in the hold. Her rudder was carried off and she floated a dismantled wreck on the waters. Her sails and cordage hung in shreds, nor could she reply with a single gun from her dismantled batteries to the unabating cannonade of the enemy. By 11 a.m., the devastated hulk of Hosh was in enemy hands and being escorted into Loch Swilly. She had lost 270 men out of 665 on board. The British had just lost 150. All French ships, bar two, were captured with a further 400 dead and 2,400 captured. The final battle of the 1798 rebellion was over. But miraculously, Wolf Tone was alive. So that brings us on to the question then. Tell us about the aftermath, because... After the atrocities and the reversals in Wexford and Armagh, after this, presumably, th- th- this is like a this is a shocked society, and there's a bunch of people either incarcerated or on the run. Absolutely, Wolf Tone is dragged to Dublin. He's put on trial, and they're about to hang him in Dublin city centre. But of course, remember he was beloved. He was really a beloved yeah. person of the city, and he was even waving at his lawyer friends who were all working for the British administration who were all pals of him in college. Remember, these guys went to Trinity. These were yeah. these were posh dudes, you know? Yeah. And of, of which Patrick O'Brien later became an honorary fellow, to make a little connection. <laughs> of course, of course. And uh, Robert Emmett also went to Trinity. And it, it's very interesting, the, the Republican history of that college, which is quite res- resolutely unionist now. Again, the, the, the odd turnaround. Yeah. But the, the Tone, what happens, it mimics a, a recent story in history. Tone is meant to, the night before he is hung, uh, have slit his own throat with a razor, you know, uh, shades of Jeffrey Epstein here. And yeah. um, I go through in my show, The Murder of Wolf Tone, which you can see online, uh, the reasons why it, it was murder in prison. It wasn't, it, it, it couldn't have been, he had done amateur theatricals and stuff like that as well. But he wouldn't have wanted to lose the opportunity to end his days in front of an audience, you know, yeah. Yeah. and maybe say a few words yeah, like Robert Emmett did. And I think that's what the authorities were scared of too. And yeah, they got rid of given a platform, yeah. Absolutely. And again, it's very funny, you know, the aftermath as well. A lot of people go on the run like your two guys in Master and Commander yeah. um, and hide in plain sight, if you know what I mean. Yeah. A lot of them change their stories. A lot of them turn around. You can go to graveyards now where, where you know people have died in the 1798 rebellion and it says they died in 1799 or 1797. <laughs> they just wow. even they even changed the year because to, to have been connected with it, was yeah. almost to put a noose around your neck. And the punishments were dreadful. Hanging, drawing, and quartering. The, the two Shears brothers, the leaders after Lord Edward Fitzgerald, were both hung, drawn, and quartered, holding mm. hands, walking to the gallows. The, the imagery is desperate. Uh, Robert Emmett himself tried to have another rebellion in 1803, and then he was hung and beheaded on Thomas Street uh, to a large crowd of 20,000 people. Uh, if they'd had 20,000 come out on the rebellion, yeah, it might have made a different, different story. Yeah. You know, more people went to the execution than the 80 who went to the bloody rebellion. You know, yeah. these, these kind of things. So, again, there are six rebellions through Irish history, all of them dreadful failures. But eventually, when we get up to Michael Collins and that, there is success. But it was very sad what happened afterwards. And it, it did change Ireland. There was the Act of Union. Yeah. Uh, the, the Parliament was ended in Dublin. And it was amalgamated into Westminster. And that's why we had that issue of repealing of the Union and Catholic emancipation. Strangely, again, another turnabout, Catholics liked the Act of Union because they thought they'd get a fairer shake off the British administration than their own Protestant overlords. And Protestants were anti-union, anti-unionists. 
yeah. because they liked having their own parliament. Yeah, they so had a good thing going. Right, right. <laughs> they had a good thing going. And weirdly, then the Presbyterians, they get rid of the penal laws for them. And they start working more for the union because life is better for them. And, you know, they were scared so much by what happened. You know, you know, something like 60 Presbyterian ministers were hung outside their churches. You know, that, wow. that really scares a community. Yeah. And yet we all forget that history. There's a great book by Guy Biner called Forgetful Remembrance. Mm-hmm. And that's really what all my shows are about. My shows are really about what have we forgotten here? What are the things we're not talking about? And who are the winners and losers of history? I also go to the newspapers and how the newspapers, I mean, sorry to quote your ex-president, Mike, but, uh, you know, <laughs> fake news is not new. <laughs> Believe me. Believe me, as he might say. And, it's, it's, uh, like, it's like he was with us in the room. That's amazing. I'm sorry. I've, I've been doing Trump impersonations since 2016. And, um, it, you know, he was not wrong. And, and you notice that the same things happen again and again. The winners write history. The losers are forgotten. One quick story. Humbert resurfaces again. When he had surrendered at, at Balnamook, um, he, he surrendered to Edward Packenham, who was Lord Longford at the time. And he meets Packenham again because when England tries to invade America again in 1812, there's Humbert living in New Orleans, fighting with Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. So he finally wins against his old nemesis. Edward wow. Packenham is shot fatally on the um, he's shot fatally on the battlefield, and he has to go home on a ship with his wife, who thought she was going to be the governess of Louisiana, and her husband is there in a barrel of rum to try and preserve his body for the six-week journey back to Longford. Unfortunately, the sailors on the ship figure out there's a barrel of rum, and they drink it, little oh realizing Edward Packenham's body is in there. So by the time they get back to Longford, there is no more Edward Packenham, let's be honest. But there's a statue to him in Westminster. But you get the only joke of 1798 out of that story. When Humbert defeated Packenham and sent him home in a barrel of rum, he said, at least I sent him home in high spirits. <laughs> oh, oh. Rim, rim shot, please. <laughs> I'm trying to get all my my seafaring stories for you. <laughs> it's great material. You know, I'm 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 now wondering. You know, Patrick O'Brien and and his sort of nod towards Irishness and everything in the midst of this story with all the kind of Stephen narrating for us a lot of the complexity and narrating for his friend Jack the complexity of the United Irishman. There's also a little subplot, which we haven't gotten to yet, but it's about Stephen's asp, his uh, serpent that he has preserved in a jar of spirits, which gets drunk by the sailors. And ah, I'm oh, wondering if this yeah. is O'Brien doing a nod to your story here, as, as he would be wont to do, for it to occur right in the middle of all this United Irishman uh, unfolding around it. Oh, my gosh. Thank That's you so much, Patty, because I kept trying to think, why does he have this asp in the spirits here? I don't get it. I don't get it. Now, perhaps I do. Yeah. Wouldn't we be on the wit of somebody with Irish sympathies to to, yes. to personify a snake as packing them? Well, right. we've no snakes in Ireland. You know that, lads. Of it's course, Patrick. right. <laughs> they say that St. Patrick, St. Patrick got rid of the snakes out of Ireland. But what we all say here is, no, 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 they're, they're here. They're just in the parliament. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we have a similar saying here. Or if we don't, we should. <laughs> you've talked a little bit already about your live shows. Um, you've done live shows in the past about 1798, and you've got a live show coming up now, I think. Tell, tell us a bit about your plans, especially now that restrictions are being lifted and we're all able to go out and experience a bit of live entertainment again. Well, COVID was a shocker for me. I mean, mm-hmm. I used to do a lot of live shows everywhere. But over the two years, I, I got clever. I learned Final Cut. And I made these documentaries at home, The Murder of Murder of Wolf Tone, Parts 1 and 2, and The Murder of Michael Collins, Parts 1 and 2. And you can buy and download them on my website, paddycullivan.com. But now I'm bringing, because it's the 100th anniversary of Michael Collins' yeah. death at Bail na Blaw, which was a terribly mysterious death and very similar to the, to the death of JFK, uh, down to lots of strange details like missing autopsies and missing guns and bullets and things like that. And... I'm bringing it out in the road. So I'm going to be oh. all through March. I will be in various cities in Ireland and Northern Ireland, but I will also be coming to uh, London, uh, Newcastle on April 6th, Birmingham, April 7th and London on April 8th and 9th. And uh, go to my website, paddycullivan.com for details of that. I'll be in the Irish cultural center in Hammersmith, which is a fantastic venue. And uh, just around the corner from where Michael Collins worked as a postal office finance clerk, from 1910 to 1915. 
but uh, where he was also a super spy and he was spying on Lloyd George and stuff like that. So there's great details and fun in those stories as well. Paddy, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast talking to you. We've learned a huge amount about 1798 and things before and things after as well. Big pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much, guys. It was brilliant. I think Stephen and Dylan in their conversation had given us a little bit of appreciation for how complicated this was. And and Stephen explaining this to Jack. But boy, I love, uh, you know, love what we've learned from Patty here. And I love his ability to kind of uh, wrap all this stuff up with music and poetry and uh, the other things, as well as great historical insights. His his, uh, YouTube stuff is fabulous as well. Thank you so much, Patty. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Well, let's just pick it up then with Stephen and Jack. They were on their way out of Stephen's uh, lodgings to go and hang out with Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown from the dockyard. That Mr. Brown. Oh, yeah, him. The one, the, uh, the, the, the what was it, the tail-bearing, fiddle-playing. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, double-poxed hound. Anyway, they're, they're still good friends with Mr. Brown. Um, they sit down with Mr. Brown and his daughter, and they play the Mozart B flat quartet while Mrs. Brown Sr., the wife, is sitting there as their sole audience with the cat. And Mike, this is a nice little moment, another Mozart quote. I can remember when I first came across this, thinking, okay, Mozart B flat, Mozart B flat. I wonder which one it was, you know, thinking back to our queries about Locatelli and are any of these references real? And there are quite a few quartets by Mozart in B flat major, so we've got plenty to choose from. And I listened to them all. I thought, well, my favorite out of all of these is a fairly well-known one, the quartet number 17, K458, The Hunt. And I was feeling quite pleased with myself. And then I looked back at the text. And of course, O'Brien's put a clue in there about which Mozart quartet he means. Um, They played, it says, they played the Mozart B-flat quartet, hunting it along with great industry and goodwill. So well done, Patrick O'Brien, for giving us a clue. It was the quartet in B-flat, K458. And they have a little light meal. And I'm not quite sure why they're refreshing themselves now, given that they're going to get amply refreshed at Molly Hart's later on. But anyhow, they're sitting down with the with the Brown family and a thirsty Jack drinks down three glasses of Sillery wine and starts getting a bit red-faced and rambunctious and maybe even lubricious. His eyes start drifting towards the bosom of the daughter, a bosom which the fashion of that year, it says, magnified by the distance from Paris, had covered with no more than a very, very little piece of gauze. And, and Mike, we get this nice vision of S- Stephen once again as a silent, disapproving observer at Jack's dinner table manners. Um, Stephen sees Mrs. Brown now looking grave, her daughter looking demurely down, and Mr. Brown, as drunk himself as Jack is, starting a bawdy story that can't end well. And the women decide to withdraw and leave the gentlemen at their table. Always, always a good plan. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> when when the guys turn in that direction. With that in mind, I think we should all go contemplate our own table manners <laughs> and the fact that we need to especially monitor our condition when it's been a little warm, we're a little thirsty, and we're just pouring down that celery too quickly. Yeah. But have a glass, maybe two, and please come back and rejoin us after this break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Well, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed a glass. Hope you checked out some Mozart while you're away. Um, Mike, we are back with Stephen. And with Jack, and they're heading off to the second round of entertainment that they've got planned for the day, which is Molly Hart's party, or as O'Brien calls it, her route. And th- this is a pretty authentic word that we've picked up here, right? It, it really is. It's you know an engram high of eighteen oh seven, and fascinatingly, it meant at the time um, a, a, an evening party or reception. And it also meant at the time what we've increasingly come to know it as, as a disorderly retreat of defeated troops or a yeah. sound defeat. So, um, and I think as the scene unfolds, we might find that it's both here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this large party is filled with all of the important people of the island. You know, Jack and Stephen are in amongst the British establishment, the British naval establishment and British society in microcosm here. In Mahon, we have officers, ecclesiastics, civilians, 
merchants and Menorcan notables. And we have a little bit of uh, Regency manners going on here. Stephen isn't acquainted with any of these people, and the social code says that you don't really have a social connection or intercourse with people until you've been formally introduced. So Jack introduces his particular friend, Stephen Maturin, in the receiving line. And Molly Hart takes one look and thinks, I'm, I'm prepared to dislike this man very much. And then Jack moves on and introduces Stephen to Captain Hart himself, who O'Brien tells us already dislikes him, but for an entirely different reason. And Mike, what do you think is going on there? Molly Hart disliking Stephen? How can that be? Yeah, well, I you know, I wondered the same thing. And, and of course, we know Stephen is sometimes just shuffled and Jack was trying to sort of whip him into putting something decent on. Could have been his his looks or his dress. Could have been maybe, you know, if this is his particular friend that, uh, you know, she's a little concerned she's going to get a little less time with Jack if he's got yeah. this great friend that he admires and everything else. So I don't know. Any any other thoughts here? We know, we know of course, why Captain Hart dislikes him because he's Aubrey's friend, but... Yeah, I think so. Maybe it's just that Molly would like to be, you know, a bit of exclusivity over the the the, the company of Jack. I think that's a really great point. Um, this is pretty quickly wiped out, though. Um, Captain Hart um, looks over Stephen's head, says "happy" in this kind of very downbeat way, and holds out two fingers. The text says two fingers, only a little way in front of his sagging belly. Stephen looked deliberately at them, left them dangling there, and silently moved his head in a bow, whose civil insolence so exactly matched his welcome that Molly Hart, here comes the reversal, that Molly Hart said to herself, I shall like this man. Yes. I'm like, this this two-fingered salute, maybe it's a very British thing. It's a sort of traditional, almost uh, schoolboy, you know, insolent salute. Um, It's two fingers held up with the palm toward the giver of the salute, exactly. So not the Winston Churchill V for victory sign with the palm away, not the um, I love the peace campaign in the 60s V sign, not the I'm a cute Asian school kid posing for the photographs V sign. This is the V sign with the palm toward me and the back of my hand towards you. Legend has it that this salute is meant to be rude and insulting because it dates back to the medieval wars between England and France and English longbowmen who were the big kind of military asset of the English kings at the time Um, if captured were said to have their two or three middle fingers removed to stop them being able to function as bowmen. So if you're a proud, victorious um, and bragging English bowman and you meet some French bowmen on the battlefield, you'll show those two fingers to show that you're uncaptured and still able to draw your bow. I've read the legend many times. I've read research on the internet that says nobody's ever actually found a specific mention of longbowmen actually using this salute. So maybe it's fictitious, but certainly all the way through the 20th century, um, every school child known to British society who wanted to insult their friend would raise the two fingers up like this. So, so they're at the party and, and Jack joins a group of, of English officers there, naval officers. And he's, you know, one of them addresses him as lucky Jack Aubrey, a term we'll, we'll hear now and again there. And they're all heartily congratulating him for his prizes. You know, some of these captains and post captains. And O'Brien says, you know, now some are a bit sad and some are a bit envious, but they're all, you know, they all have what Stephen always observes is this good natured uh, Royal Navy sense about them. Um, and now they, in addition to all of Jack's prior silly, they're all drinking heavily of some punch there. And uh, Jack joins them, and they keep putting more and more punch in his hands. As Jack recounts, as O'Brien writes, in an uninhibited wealth of sea jargon, how each prize was taken. Now, Stephen, watching them, observed to himself that at some levels, complete communication between men was possible. And I, I, I had a bit of a <laughs> chuckle at this here <laughs> to say, yeah. oh, you mean guys can really talk to each other? Sure, when it's with a lot of sea jargon about how I took that prize, we can. And Stephen finds himself, and I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what this, you know, it, it almost sounds like too good of a metaphor or a simile or something, standing at this orange tree. And on the one side of the orange tree are you know, Jack and these men talking. And on the other side are all these women and you know daughters and sisters and and you know women kind of waiting for the men to come pay attention to them which they are not doing and o'brien notes that the women hope that their husbands brothers fathers lovers would not get too drunk and above all that none of them would grow quarrelsome 
So mm. perhaps another telling commentary on men, you know, and, and yeah. one of the early notes of a bit of a crescendo that builds through this chapter here. We, we pick up on this note of you know, the potential for quarrels. Um, one captain actually complains of a quarrel that he's encountered, not between the officers, but between the uh, the foremast hands. Some of the Sophie's men on a run ashore had beaten up the crew of Captain Oak's barge upon what he called the absurd pretense that they, the Sophie's, had a physician aboard and had precedence over any other vessel that was uh, with, sailing with a mere surgeon. And Jack apologizes and says, well, this, this pretense is not so absurd. It's actually true. And Mike, at, at long last, we get a detailed account of what we had heard about only in passing a couple of chapters ago. Um, Jack gives us our most detailed account so far of Stephen's operation on the gunner. Jack says he opened our gunner's skull, roused out his brains. This is Jack drunk, remember? Right. Set them to rights, stuffed them back in again. I could not bear to look, I assure you, gentlemen. Bade the armourer take a crown piece, hammer it out, thin into a little dome, do you see, or basin, and so clapped it on, screwed it down, and sewed up his scalp as neatly as a sailmaker. Now that's what I call real physic. None of your damn pills and delay. I might, you, you can almost hear the kind of growling and sort of appreciative, well, maybe some of them appreciating, some of them going, really? You know, I, I call BS. Anyhow. Right. <laughs> Um, Jack gets to introduce Stephen to this this little bunch of people, right? And then Stephen gets drawn into his own private version of medical conversations here. Yeah, I, I think this is probably the fate of so many doctors at so many parties everywhere. You know, there's yeah, always yeah. somebody that gives you that look and then pulls you off to the side. And, and at this time, it's a Captain Nevin who wants to talk privately about his digestion and his, and, and I love what Patrick Tall is reading this, his, his, his evacuation you know some problems <laughs> so, you know and and as steven's talking to captain devon there's kind of that you know as as sometimes happens this little quiet lull in the party but in the midst of this lull steven hears jack with his ocean going voice that you know reaches the end of the ship and then some um saying oh yes yes the rest of them are certainly coming ashore. They're lining the rail in their shore-going rig with money in their pockets, their eyes starting out of their heads, and their pricks a yard long. And Stephen's a little aghast here, and he's watching the ladies' very indignant glances as they start moving away from the men, you know, from on this other side of the orange tree. Jack sees the women starting to go, and then, to Stephen's complete chagrin, yeah. Jack calls out, as O'Brien writes, crimson face the look of maniac glee in his blazing eyes and his triumphant you needn't hurry ladies they won't be allowed off the sloop till the evening gun well <laughs> now Stephen's like oh my gosh and and as he's standing there trying to think of what to do this molly hart has got his sleeve and is saying you know what you just go tell your captain, your friend, and do you know you do whatever it takes to get him out of here before he does himself some more damage. So Stephen walks over quickly, takes Jack by the elbow very imperiously, says, Come, come, come. And he invokes that magic phrase that we know that Jack knows the meaning of. There is not a moment to be lost. Great save. Great save by Stephen there, saving Jack from himself. And once again, this is not the first time nor the last time that Jack's friends, in this case, Molly and Stephen, um, are going to intervene when he's ashore to save him from himself. And uh, at least on this occasion, Mike, Jack doesn't put up too much resistance. Right, right. Thank goodness. Right. Stephen's just able to grab him by the elbow and take him away. And we kind of draw the curtain on this little episode at Molly Hart's party, and we get to be with everybody back aboard the Sophie for the aftermath. And Jack now is hurrying to set sail before Captain Hart can send for him, because he's pretty sure any conversation with Hart is not going to go well at this point, or before he gets new orders cutting off the Sophie's cruise, because, you know, maybe Hart could countermand Keith's orders and send Jack off to do something tedious. Um, he really longs to be at sea, although not only to get away from Hart, but I think just to get away from the thought and the association and the atmosphere associated with the drunkenness at this party. He longs to be at sea, it says, where he could not be betrayed by his own tongue, where Stephen could not get himself into bad odour with authority. I don't, I don't know why it is that he gets the idea that it's Stephen who's going to get into bad odour with authority, but never mind. Right. Um, and where that infernal child Babington did not have to be rescued from aged women of the town. Yeah, okay. There's a stick a pin in that for Babington's character for the future. Right. And 
where James Dillon could not fight a duel. And again, just in passing, we get this mention of the fact that James Dillon had ended up in a quarrel. Um, Jack doesn't want to lose Dillon. He says he's an officer as valuable as any he'd ever sailed with. And Jack realizes that he's done himself some harm and he would have done more harm to himself had he stayed. And we learn more about this character of the child Babington and we get an insight into Jack's really very high opinion of Dylan, but it's kind of slight tinged with despair here that maybe Dylan's going to go into some kind of self-destructive spiral, for example, by getting into a duel. And I don't, don't know where this bad odor comes from. Maybe it's jealousy about being a physician. Uh, maybe it's about the Irish Catholic connection. And is Dylan going to say something that gets everybody into trouble again? I really doubt it. I think it's Jack and maybe Dylan who are going to cause trouble. And maybe this could have something to do with that other occupational interest that we were talking about a couple of seconds ago that we're going to learn about in later books. And we're going to hear many books later that this was coming along in the uh, in the in, in the early days after um, Stephen had been aboard the Sophie. If you're across this little premonition of Stephen's future professional occupation, then uh, we want to say thank you on your behalf to Alan Schaufler, who posted some really, really great text from the 13 Gun Salute on the Patrick O'Brien Appreciation Society Facebook page. Uh, great job, Alan. You've pointed out a few things that are important for us here. So what, what's Jack going to do here to get himself extricated from this mess and get his crew into clean air and clean spirits? Well, Jack decides, uh, they, he gets a report about how many men are there, how many are missing. There's two tons of water still not aboard, but Jack's like, no. Forget it. We're going. We're going now. And he tells him to unmoor silently. And, and I think it's both to save his throbbing head and many of the crew members who also have throbbing heads, but also to attract no attention. And O'Brien writes that, you know, he's ready to leave the town with its evil smells sunk into the haze behind him so that he can sail out into this, what he calls the brilliant open water out front. Um, O'Brien describes the Sophie now as a wooded, watered, well-found vessel beginning her journey back to independence. So, you know, back on this cruise. And Jack is kind of patting himself on the back or probably saying a silent, oh, thank goodness, that yeah. he had taken care of all the repairs and stores and vittling, you know, all except for the last of that water when they first arrived, which is a habit that I wish I could develop a little bit more and and, and could, as Jack <laughs> says, enjoy the reward of virtue. You know, you, you do what you got to do, so you do what you want to do, right? But, <laughs> um, yeah, and it, as you mentioned Ian, earlier, there's another great theme of the canon, this, you know, the evils mm. ashore for Jack and the potential glory and certainly the happier days at sea. Oh. Yes. And I really love the writing in this little passage here. He he uses this very vivid language to describe just how grotty and inadequate <laughs> and fed up the crew and Jack and the ship all are. You know, they come ashore, we are trailing clouds of glory, and they've got themselves debauched and filthy. Um, there's some, some great Orion language here about the crew in their hungover state. They had no money left, for one thing, says O'Brien. And they were grey, drooping, and mum chance for another. And this is a great word, uh, mum chance. It means silent or tongue tied. It's another great engram hit for the early 19th century. Had a peak around 1860. And I think O'Brien uses it in Treason's Harbour as well to describe a sort of melancholy and tongue tied bunch of people. Um, we also have this lovely phrase the grey stench of a crapulous dawn. And uh, crapulous, Mike, that means caused by or showing the effects of alcohol. Um, again, some big engram peaks if you look at the engram viewer on Google um, back in 1806, 1831. So it's a great 19th century word. And Mike, in, in the 20th century at university, I think you and I could have done with knowing that. Oh, yeah. I had many crapulous dawns. I just didn't know to call them that. I, it, it would have been a much more <laughs> beautiful word to use. <laughs> oh, well, we're back on the ship, we're out, we're sailing again, and we get to Thursday, and all hands are piped to witness punishment. This punishment is for seven crew members who are being whipped for drunkenness, not for being drunk when they were in port, not for arriving back on the ship and being unable to stand, but out here during the cruise. Jack even had to cancel one of their live gunnery practices for fear of you know, drunk crew members hurting themselves in the midst of this. And Jack wonders, 
you know, how in the world are they getting this alcohol? You know, are they breaking yeah. into the spirits room? Did somebody bring a stash back somehow from on shore here? But he wants to make sure that all the officers are in their best uniforms, giving the punished men their due ceremony. So fascinating here. You know, he's really upset about the harm that these guys could cause themselves and, and the interference with the regular activities of the ship. But even in their punishment, got to give them that respect here. So as the men are flogged, O'Brien gives us some insights into different customs and beliefs, you know, like these, you know, the respect of the best uniforms yeah. and the differing traditions on different ships that on some ships like the Sophie, it's the tradition to be silent during the flogging on other ships. And, and one of these crew members has come from another ship. You cry out every time you're hit here. Yeah. And, um, you know, in and, and Jack's observing one of the traditions here is when it's not such an awful offense, perhaps that the bosun's mate can make the knotted ends of the whip land on the capstan, you know, <laughs> rather than actually on the bare back of the men here. But um, when this one guy starts to cry out, you know, the, 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 the bosun's mate really kind of backs off and the bosun intervenes, not, you know, not with any <laughs> ill intent towards the band, but to say, you know, a Come job on. of work must be done properly here. So again, I love how O'Brien is kind of just giving us all this little detail and insight here. Um, so Stephen notes, having gone through all this, how utterly barbarous this would seem to a spectator that was not habituated to it. And he observes how little it matters to those who are. So even Babington, young Babington, who we keep talking about, and we love Babington for, for <laughs> books and books and books, um, is pale and anxious because there was one guy who, when this other guy was calling out, had wet himself. And then, and then you know, so he's, he's added, as, as O'Brien says, the crime of incontinence to yeah. drunkenness, that he gets up there and, you know, he's crying and peeing. And the purser's mate who's, who's doing the flogging, he tries to get this over very quickly. And, and Babington is looking pale and anxious. But O'Brien says, 10 minutes later, Babington and the other boys are up skylarking in the ring. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's an interesting and, and I think quite realistic and contemporary touch. I'm reminded of the movie. And in the movie, we get a scene where one of the men is flogged and we get the faces of the children and the children are really um, shocked. And I think we're meant to join in being shocked at the physical brutality of the flogging. And Stephen is unhappy with the flogging. But yeah, in a different context. And Stephen, in that moment, in that story, is quite unhappy with the discipline generally anyway. We get pointed out to us here that Stephen isn't completely against flogging per se. He reflects on the fact that we've become a little bit inured to it, but he's not outraged that this is a terrible infraction of someone's liberty. He sort of sees it as, you know, part of the everyday, part of the everyday that he doesn't approve of. And he's right. interested in people's reactions to it rather than, in, you know, recoiling in horror at the very idea. Well, and, and I love Jack's idea of, of, you know, look, we're doing this not just because you were drunk and you broke a rule. We're doing this because you're going to get somebody killed and it might have been yourself. So yeah. don't do it again. Right? No. But we get this nice little pivot now. So as the punishment finishes and the young gentlemen are off skylarking in the rigging, we get another version of Jack's leadership. You know, we talked before about Jack's leadership. So he was wanting and willing to see this punishment carried out properly and with due respect. The other side of his leadership is that he cares about the education of the young gentleman. And we get this nice comic moment in Jack's cabin as he calls for them to review their daily workings. Now, we discover that the, the Sophie's old captain, Captain Allen, had uh, had tended to throw the papers out of the window uh, with a curse word and never bothered reviewing them. These daily workings, these plottings of the ship's position, are, are all obviously copied from one another. There's plagiarism going on here. Um, they are wrong. They've got the latitude about right, but the longitude says that they're 37 miles deep in a mountain range behind Valencia. And Jack says, okay, tell me how this comes to be. Uh, one of those kind of um, pa parent, angry teacher, rhetorical questions. Why? You don't really want to know why. What you really want to say is, I'm pissed at you because you haven't done this right. They know better than to try and answer the question about why they'd sent him this nonsense. And they agreed. And I love that we get this continued reported speech. They, they agree with what comes next in the text, which is actually Jack's speech, but as reported by them. They agreed that they were not there to amuse themselves, nor for their manly beauty, but rather to learn their professions, 
carrying on with this reported agreement. They agreed that their journals, which they fetched, were neither accurate, full, nor up to date, and that the ship's cat would have written them better, that they would for the future pay the greatest attention to Mr. Marshall's observation and reckoning, that they would prick the chart daily with him. And I don't know if there's a little snide joke going on in the background there about Marshall and boys and pricks and charts, but never mind. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and that no man was fit to pass for a lieutenant, let alone bear any command. May God forgive me, said Jack in an internal aside. Who could not instantly tell the position of his ship to within a minute? Nay, to within 30 seconds. This, this is the corrosive effect of authority on uh, on Jack here. Bless him. Furthermore, they would show up their journals every Sunday, clean and legibly written. And I, I love the insight here into Jack's character, into the way he chooses to set about leadership and educating these young kids. He's got the humility and self-awareness as well to sort of look at, look at himself in the mirror for a moment as he's kind of laying down the law to them and rebuking, rebuking himself for his own navigational weakness. I also write, like Mike, there's a sly little writerly joke as he decides to give some dictation practice and some handwriting practice to the midshipmen. He chooses a handy book, which he says would answer admirably for them to be read to out of from. Right. <laughs> this is, it's a little bit of an Aubreyism, stacking up all the prepositions at the end of the sentence. But I think O'Brien here is making a little joke about English usage. Um, putting a preposition at the end of the sentence is supposed to be contrary to the proper rules of English usage. And I can remember being taught at school that this is not you know, not a good style. But um, writers like O'Brien would often protest that this kind of pedantry results in very contrived and stilted English and stops them from creating kind of natural flowing prose. As someone believed to be Churchill, but I suspect not actually Churchill, um, said that this rule results in the kind of prose up with which I will not put. <laughs> I love that. I so love back that. to the two-fingered salute. I think that is Patrick O'Brien raising a two-fingered salute uh, to Fowler's modern English usage. Uh, well done. Well done, Patrick O'Brien. Uh, and then, you know, just like we pivoted from the boys up in the rigging to the boys in, in Jack's cabin in the classroom here, we pivot again to Jack is reading, as you say, to these midshipmen as they're practicing their writing. And Stephen is listening to what Jack is reading to them. It sort of comes down the air blowing into the oral out down there. And he hears Jack saying, by learning to obey, they are also taught how to command. Mm. And, and I thought that was kind of neat because it had all this, you know, punctuality and cleanliness and godliness and all that sort of stuff. But then there's some method to this madness here that, you know, you guys, as, as Jack has said, you're going to be leaders one time. And so this is why this is important here. Well, Stephen has his own troubles, just as the boys are having troubles and Jack has a few troubles here. Stephen has this patient, Cheslin, who will not eat and because of it is dying. He tells Stephen that even if there was any relish to his meat, if he wanted to eat, his messmates would not allow it. And Stephen gets into this story with Cheslin and asks why he had told his messmates what his calling was while he was a landsman. And Cheslin, you know, pleads drunkenness, saying it's it's this grog, it's much stronger than he's used to. And then Stephen walks out past Cheslin's messmates, because right next door is, is where they are eating dinner to bring Cheslin some soup. Now, we get out there and hear all these characters. Uh, they're all very respectful of the doctor. Stephen knows they're all kind creatures. They're all good natured. They have good natured faces and they are killing Cheslin. Mm. So, wow. Um, you know, this is, you know, this kind of interesting set up here. And, and again, it's a theme that we're digging deeper and deeper into this chapter here. What good guys they are and what harm they're doing here. Yeah. And this story expounded by Stephen in his conversation with Cheslet, with yet another f change of point of view, gets retold to James Dillon. Speaking of people who are able to do harm to themselves. Right. Um, Stephen's telling this story about Cheslin and his calling. And we find out what, exactly what this calling was. He says that the man was a sin eater. Cheslin is someone who, in his life back on the land, would eat a piece of bread placed on a corpse, thereby taking the dead man's sins upon himself. And 
in I think this is a particular tradition in in the west of England in the Welsh marches in the border counties around Wales. The mourners would then give the sin eater a piece of silver, chase him out, spit on him, and throw stones as he runs away. And it's a very ancient, very dark bit of kind of countryside burial practice. It's connected with all kinds of other ancient burial practices as well. Um, frowned on by the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church thinks they have a monopoly on on funerary rites, but set that to one side. Cheslin's mess, therefore, learning of this guy having this kind of despised outcast calling as a sin eater, had expelled him from the mess. And no one else would let him eat or sleep anywhere near them. And even though there's nothing physically wrong with him, therefore, Cheslin's mental and emotional state means, according to Stephen, that he could die within a week. And they're sitting here having this conversation in the gun room, and the purser chips in, saying... They should have Cheslin whipped. When when the purser, he says, had served on a slave ship between the wars, they would whip slaves who had lost the will to live in despair about take, being taken from their homes and from their country. He said that the whipping, in a horrible phrase, the whipping saved the slaves. But it would be no good, he says, for Cheslin, because the sailors would never abide a Jonah. So, Mike, we've got these all, all, all these superstitions going on in the Navy, superstitions on land. And this is a pretty grim outlook for somebody who's on the wrong side of all these superstitions, specifically Cheslin and the Sin Eater. And the purser compares Cheslin to a white crow that it gets pecked to death by others, by other crows. Um, compares him also to the albatrosses that the purser and his mates would catch and paint a red cross on, thereby bringing in the other birds to kill this albatross while these guys are watching and, and enjoying themselves. He says... The other hands wouldn't let Cheslin mess with them, even if the cruise lasted 50 years. And that raises the kind of natural question, well, then why the heck is he here? And Dylan says, well, why in God's name did he ever come into the Navy? He was a volunteer and not a pressed man. And Stephen, ever the humanitarian and the insightful guy, says, well, I conceive he was tired of being a white crow. Wow. <laughs> Which I think is a pretty fair point back at Dylan and at the purser. And I think, once again, Stephen takes on the humanitarian cause of wanting to take this guy, Cheslin, and try to make a life for him that's somehow safe and somehow whole. He's not going to lose a patient, he says to himself, just because of sailors' prejudices, and he's planning to isolate Cheslin and care for him himself, and if he recovers, to make Cheslin his lob lolly boy, his assistant. It's amazing to me, Ian. I, I, not really. I'm just... Floor though, because even even when Stephen first tells this to Dylan, it so shocks Dylan to hear Sin Eater, you know, that Dylan utters a blasphemy just straight out and knocks his port over <laughs> and is mopping up. He's just so taken with this. And and we're kind of, you know, we've got this sort of drumbeat, this crescendo building, you know, of, of man's inhumanity to man and nature, yeah. a theme that started with the flogging. It ratchets up here. It's kind of this humanity is mixed with prejudice and superstition. And, you know, sometimes our inability to see past our own nose. I mean, you know, this purser speaking of saving these slaves by whipping them and then say, but Cheslin, oh, he's not worth saving yeah. because you know the men, you know, even in 50 years won't take him on here with this thing. And fascinating that Dylan's like, well, why in the world would Cheslin join the Navy? Don't they know they'd have these feelings towards him? And you want to say, Dylan, why in the world did you what join did you the Navy? Did <laughs> yeah, you know? Great point. <laughs> you know, great you did point. exactly the same thing. <laughs> All these, you know, religious prejudices and upward mobility that you can't achieve that you're fighting against that, you know, did you expect it to be any different than what happens with Chesler? Um, and then, you know, the purser with all this portrayed as fun and, you know, good sport or a laugh here, it kind of begs the question too. Now, number one, uh, it sounds like Gillen would not give the command <laughs> to leave Cheslin alone. But, you know, could Stephen appeal to Jack? If Jack commanded the crew to leave him alone, would he do that? And and it made me think back to that original conversation about trying to rescue the men on that ship on fire and how they said, you know, yeah. there's just not much you can do with an unwilling crew here. So, yeah. where do we go with this? And, and, and it's a really great question. Would, would Jack have said... Would Jack have stepped into command to keep Cheslin alive? I really don't know, Mike. It's a great question. Right. Um, he's kind of on board with lots of sailor superstitions. He spent some time himself before the mast. He kind of goes along a little bit with this idea that there's there's no compelling a willing mind. But 
I think he's a, he's a warm-hearted guy. I think he feels for the men under his command. And I think he's starting, even at this early stage in the canon, to have his conscience pricked a little bit by the humanitarian Stephen, his particular friend. And I could see them. I could imagine he and Stephen having a bit of a debate about this. Uh, we shall see. We shall see. It might go the way of their debate with the, uh, you know, the, you know. let me c- go across and treat the plague folks, where yeah. Jack is thinking, look, even if it's all in their minds, half of them are going to die. <laughs> and yeah. So, you know, so there's some practical things. So fascinating. Ah. Well, since we're raising the question of what would Jack do, Jack in- inserts himself into this conversation that we have here with one final switch of point of view for this chapter. Um, a messenger comes bringing word that Jack would like Stephen to come on deck to see, in in quotes here, something amazingly philosophical. And Stephen duly goes up on deck and he arrives to see old Sponge, the Greek sponge diver, holding a piece of the ship's copper sheathing. And Sponge and Jack watch Stephen's amazement and delight as they turn the copper over to reveal a remora. But a a remora is a real thing, right? Oh, it is a real thing. Uh, you know, it, you know, Remora, Remora, it's, you know, which side of the pond you're on here? Remora the merrier, as far as we're concerned. Um, <laughs> they do have this really fascinating sucker, essentially, on the top of the head, a modified dorsal fin, which allows them, when they just move the parts of that, to create a vacuum, and they can attach themselves to ships, to sharks, turtles, rays, even divers uh, sometimes. Um, they, you know, they can hitch a ride, catch food along the way, and they sometimes eat the parasites that are growing on their host. So it kind of a, a little pay for their Uber, yeah. <laughs> this ride that they're catching here. I might, I probably had remoras and lampreys mixed up in my head here. A lamprey has teeth and kind of clamps on and sucks and is absolutely a parasite. A remora has this kind of sucker organ on the back of its head. So the remora isn't chewing away and gouging into its host, it just kind of latches on. In ancient times, they were believed to be able to stop ships. Their their name comes from the Latin for delay. And the genus, when we get, you know, if, if we had James Albright on the phone, he would give us the genus here for that. And it's a combination of the Greek words meaning to hold and ship. So it's kind of a fish that can hold a ship. So something tells me that Linnaeus might have named a remora. I've I've got a feeling that somewhere I've read that remora was described oh, in, in, nice, in Linnaeus' nice. coding. Yeah, there you yeah. go. They explain to Stephen that the remora had certainly torn off this copper sheathing all by itself. This the crew and the sponge fishers especially think that remoras have got mystical powers. They thought that it was strong enough to hold the Sophie motionless in a brisk gale. And now that it was gone and that they'd taken away the copper sheathing and the remora, the Sophie would surely run like a swan. Stephen, being the rationalist and enlightenment man that he is, had started to try and tell them, to educate them. This is only a nine-inch fish. It has small fins and it's a very big ship and physics wouldn't allow it. But Stephen was both too wise and too happy to yield to this temptation and he let them be with their superstition. We might come back to the remora in a second, but I'd really like to stay with O'Brien's wrapping up of this chapter here because it's a lovely bit of writing. And superstition comes true a little. He was too much of a philosopher, it says, to feel much vexation a little later when a pretty breeze reached them coming in over the rippling sea just abaft the larboard beam so that the Sophie, released from the wicked remora, heeled over in a smooth, steady run that carried her along at seven knots until sunset, when the masthead cried, Land ho! Land on the starboard bow. End of chapter six. Nice. Nice. Oh, Mike, so, Mike, this Remora thing, it's really, really interesting, the the, the, the power of people's beliefs. Oh, Mike, I... I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know for sure, but I have a strong feeling that the juxtaposition of the Sin Eater and the Remora is no accident. Wow. Sin Eaters feed on the cast-off sins of others. Remoras attach themselves to a host and feed off the, the, the feces and the parasites around the host. So b- both are misunderstood. Both suffer a bit for their place in the world. And, you know, Cheslin is a human Remora. The Remora is a human Cheslin. And... You know, we misjudge them at our peril. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and so many people for a long time thought, 
uh, that the remora is a parasite, and it's it's not. And yeah. same way, you know, we think that the sin eater is evil. No, he's not. Yeah. He's just you know some actor in this morality play of ours in in burial traditions here. Well, you know, I think it for me this chapter is just it's it's a great feature of the fact that that Master and Commander is is a, a an excellent naval historical fiction novel and yeah. great literature on the human condition. I mean. You know, we're, we're, and we're watching, as you've said before, and we're watching O'Brien continue to do this amazing world building. You know, this could easily be, you know, some fantasy novel. It could be a scene out in space in science fiction. But we're doing this world building with the details of the time and place. And we've got these incredibly interesting characters. Yeah, We've got uh, Dylan and Jack. Dylan's not a fan of Jack, but we know that Jack so far is a fan of Dylan. Dylan's getting darker and darker in in his conflicts with his faith, with his dueling. We've got his heritage and his self-identity. We've heard a lot about just how traumatized people were coming out of the 1798 rebellion. Dylan's sense of honor also alongside his sense of being poorly treated at the hands of the Navy, not getting promoted as quickly as Jack Aubrey. Um, And we have a glimpse of how tough these issues become for people we get examples of you know dylan and his conflict we have cheslin and the purser stories about slaves getting whipped Th- this is an environment where you know people can be pretty isolated and pretty badly treated stephen is attempting to take on the sailor's prejudice with cheslin and mike who, who knows how that's going to work out right. is he actually going to ask jack to step in and try and save the life of this guy cheslin or are we going to fall back on superstition the Sophie's independent cruise seems to have just about been kept intact by sneaking out in the uh, in the calm of the dawn here. Um, are there more potential prizes? Have we got an encounter with the enemy coming anytime soon? Are we going to get a recall from Captain Hart? I don't know. You know, I think there's only one thing for it. What do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. <laughs> would raise the two fingers up like this so oh no that's great there we go there's there's mosey with his dog dog version of the two finger salute right <laughs> <laughs>